All right, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and thank you, Tom, for all the hard work you've done in, in organizing uh, this series of webinars. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Bin Yu, uh, who is going to address us today. Uh, I'm going to read you her bio in a second, but before I do, I want to say that Bin is a leading light in data science. Um, she's done uh, more thinking about it than anyone I know about about uh, how data science should be done, could be done, um, and uh, generally advance the ball on the national and international scale. So I thought it would be good for us to kick off our webinar series by hearing from, uh, from her. Ben is Chancellor's Distinguished Professor and Class of 1936 Second Chair in the Departments of Statistics and of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at UC Berkeley and a former chair of statistics at UC Berkeley. Her research focuses on practice, algorithms, and theory of statistical machine learning and causal inference. Her group is engaged in interdisciplinary research with scientists from genomics, neuroscience, and precision medicine. In order to augment empirical evidence for decision-making, they are investigating methods and algorithms and associated statistical inference problems, such as dictionary learning, non-negative matrix factorization, EM and deep learning and heterogeneous effect estimation in randomized experiments. Their recent algorithms include STA NMF for unsupervised learning experiments, uh, iterative random forests, which goes by the name IRF, and signed iterative random forests for discovering predictive and stable high order interactions in supervised learning, contextual decomposition and aggregated contextual decomposition for phrase or patch importance extraction from an LSTM or CNN. Uh, I'm looking for uh, LSTM here, but I don't see it. Um, uh, she is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She was a Guggenheim Fellow in 2006 and the Tukey Memorial Lecturer of the Bernoulli Society in 2012. Bin was president of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics from 2013 to 2014 and the REITS lecturer of the IMS in 2016. She received the E.L. Scott Award from the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies in 2018. Yu was also a founding co-director of Microsoft Research Asia Lab at Peking University and is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board at the UK's Alan Turing Institute for Data Science and AI. Uh, and with that, um, I think we'll turn it over to Ben. Thank you, Amy, mm -hmm. for a very kind introduction. Mm -hmm. And it's really my pleasure and honor to speak to this group who work on really important problems relating to uh, climate change or climate uh, variability. Mm -hmm. And what I want to, hear, to share here is really a framework me and my uh, collaborators have built over the last 10 years uh, on how to kind of do data science and before the name became very popular and it's really come from quite a few projects and we kind of summarize in the framework hopefully for other people to uh, to take advantage of. So it's really the, the goal is to practice responsible data science and decision making. And if you are wondering what vertical means, here it is, it means truthful. And actually the name is, um, suggested to me by a colleague, Tian Zhang from Columbia University. I had you know, really this long title for three principal data science. And she thought it was too long and we need something short and sweet. And she suggested this and we all liked it. So we adopted it. Um, I didn't know the name, you know, what this means either when she suggested it, so I had to look up. So actually my journey to end up here really started um, with um, interacting and being mentored by Leo Brahman when I was a young professor and Leo Brahman was a senior professor in Berkeley. So many of you probably have seen this paper about two, uh, 20 years ago called Statistical Modeling, Two Cultures. On one hand, you have the data modeling culture, mainly from um, statistics. The other, you have the computer science modeling culture, which is algorithms. The same year, he also published a very important paper called Random Forests. So my recent work has been motivated by biomedical problem, neuroscience, genomics, and precision medicine. And the data science definition I'm pretty happy with is really, it's a combination of three fields, computer science, medicine, stat, and domain knowledge. But the goal 
it's really make decisions and generate new knowledge and domain knowledge is quite important. And some people say data science has to be the intersection. Other people say that you, you know, it's any piece of it, but, uh, but we should agree that for really solving problems, we need a team cover all three areas. I will call it like a team brain. And let's take a look at more abstractly the data science life cycle. I'd like you to think about as a hardware, as a system, that there are many, many, many steps. You have a domain question, say maybe you guys are interested to see, uh, to predict a hundred years from now, what would be the uh, climate? Are we gonna get much warmer or are we gonna get okay? And one question I have is like, oh, this coronavirus, um, people's shelter in place, is it changing our climate or not? Can you see that? And then we have data collection. Oh, using public data, but you do make choices. Either design experiment to collect it, or you decide what public re repository you're gonna use. So there's a lot of decision. That's why I put it in the middle, judgment call. Make so many, so many judgment call. And then data cleaning, right? Usually we don't talk about it. And there are many different ways in genomic, at least for RNA-seq data, you have at least two standard ways people seem to buy into to clean the data. Would you get the same result? And then you enter more traditional statistical domain data exploration and modeling and modeling. We have for supervised learning, we have many, many, many different ways, easily five or 10, and people choose one and report. And then you analyze, you also make this choice, what to present, what not to present. That's why there's a book called uh, Statistics or How to Lie with Statistics. There's some you know, truth to, you can really lie with statistics or data. And then communication, again, you make judgment calls, how to pick something. And then you update domain knowledge and you go back. So this whole cycle, if it's a hardware, then you don't want to be very fragile, right? You want it to be quality controlled and in a way standardized so that we can really trust what's coming out of this system. So with critical data sign, we define as extremely reliable reproducing information from data. I want to emphasize, we want to an enrich technical language to communicate and evaluate empirical evidence in the context of human decisions and domain knowledge. And machine learning has been really, really creative in creating new names. Uh, if you ask me, I think it's a little too much, but statistics has the other problem. We don't introduce any new names. So we're completely like in a high jacket that we're constrained by the concepts we put words to it. So I think somewhere in the middle, would be good, a healthy balance to have new things to describe the new problems we um, encounter. It's just not mathematics. We need new concepts. We need new te technical language to describe the situation we're in. For the rest of the talk, I will introduce the PCS framework. Uh, P means predictability. C means computability. S means stability for radical data science. And I'll say very briefly, the RF, uh, basically adding stability to uh, Leo Bryman's random forest for genomic problems and possibly for other problems. So what's the PCS framework? So the paper finally, uh, well, it didn't update, appeared this year in preceding National Academy of Sciences. It's really tried to bridge Leo Brahman's two cultures. P taken from machine learning, right? Machine learning really made prediction at the center and also computability. Everything has to be computed before you worry about it. Statistics really expanded version of statistical inference to the whole pipeline. And my uh, co-author of a book we're writing, Rebecca drew this beautiful um, description of what we mean. My contribution is like add some data into the soil, right? It's like you take the nutrients and you build this PCS tree. And this is really try to integrate machine learning and statistics and create one culture. So PCS is really a connection between science engineering. I feel like data science is really both science and engineering. And predictability and stability also embed two important scientific principles, prediction and replication. And computability is really a necess necessity for today's um, data-driven activities. But I want to point it out that it's not just, we also expand on the computability of uh, machine learning because I want to include data inspired simulations, which I think happen a lot in this community, that you have PDEs, but you also have data. 
So that's also part of computer vision. How do you design such uh, simulation models? It's not just about risk of convergence, how fast your algorithm is, and communication. It's also about the design of uh, data-driven simulations. So I start um, getting on this stability topic. Uh, the paper came out 2013, and Amy actually just told me that her former advisor, Jan uh, Yavasaka from UCLA, actually, I just read a bit, had a textbook, has quite a bit on stability, which I didn't know. Uh, that uh, he was very concerned with stability. That book, somehow, um, I didn't see it. But this is a common sense principle, right? If you think about this system, if you talk to any layman, anybody said, you want something, you want that thing to be stable. This is not some deep, but it's very useful common sense principle. He said, we want things, the system of build can withhold many, many perturbations to the system and want it to be robust. Well, I started looking at stability for the sake of interoperability and reproducibility, and later we felt like it's needed for scientific hypothesis generation or intervention design, some kind of bridging into causal inference. And this is really expansion on the statistical inference, which is a sample to sample variability. You can see the perturbation is another sample. But I want to expand it to the whole pipeline. How do you think of stability? So first, you do need predictability. Without predictability, you don't have a reality check. You can just always go for a constant. It's very, very stable problem, has nothing to do with your problem. So it's after stability, you after predictability, you know you have something capture reality, then you want to shake the whole system and make sure it doesn't break. You have different ways to formulate the problem. You can use different modality of data. Which satellite data you use? You use MISER or use uh, something else? Oh, MODIS. How did you clean the data? You have two graduate students, would you get the same result? So all this, every step, you have choices you made on top of replication of experiments. So the goal is that you want things to be stable to this human judgment cause. And the workflow is really want to consider PCS in every step of the DSLC, you may ask, what do you mean by predictability on problem formulation? That's more like meta level. When you formulate the problem, you should think about the future because you don't do the problem just because for today, right? Usually if you only care about today, I think we should stop everything and just go out, have fun. It's something in the future that you care about and you want to bring that in. Is that gonna be from precision medicine, the same population patients or something else. Oh, uh, are you interested in this particular regional model? Is that only going to work for the US? It's going to work for Europe too, right? You want to think about who and when and how whatever you develop now will be used in the future. And computability is always there, just to give you an example. And even for uh, domain problem formulation, where you have multidiscipline teams, there's uh, something called linguistic stability. That's the same word means the same thing. It's not always the case, right? Matrix in cancer genomics or cancer uh, research means something very different than mathematical matrix. So all of they just give you a high level conceptual suggestions for people to think about. And so things become easier and uh, more standardized. And we also expanded down statistical inference to PCS inference so that we don't just look at, suppose there's a true probability model, you look at the derivation. We talk about different model perturbations and cleaning and have perturbation intervals. So the more common use data perturbation, if things are independent and then distributed, which usually not the case for this community, you have different forms and people usually pick one and do it. And you can also remove some trends and look at the residuals and they're more likely to sell exchangeable and not too dependent, and you kind of scramble up, you can do some bootstrap, do block bootstrap, and Leo Brahman also advocate adding small noise to data, which is very actually useful for all type of problem. You should withhold, whatever you build should withstand some small noise to uh, the data. And the more recent form, I think, is data modality choices, right? It's probably relevant to this group, is that which satellite are you going to use? Are you going to use some ground stations? Are you going to fly some airplane to get some data too? How do you integrate that? And the synthetic data perturbation is also relevant for this group. You have often you simulate from PDE model. Do you have different PDE models? And 
would you get the same result? So I see now PDE simulation as a form of data perturbation. So therefore, unite the statistic and more applied math way of doing climate science or uh, environmental science is that you have observational data from your instruments and you also have simulation data. And you might just, in terms of building computing platform, it's much easier. We actually did something, I think, with Amy to, to do uh, aerosol retrieval. And we basically use the PD simulation as the mean function and put a, a statistical Gaussian regret, auto regression model on top of that. So that's very integrated. But what we could have done is that we simulate from these PD models and real data, we just put them together and we feed a statistical model. The, the ease of that is that we have only one computing platform and you can change the PDE models without changing your platform. But you have to decide what's the weight between the two. That's kind of like a smoothing parameter. In a way, it's a more sophisticated way of shrinking the model towards a PDE model. And you want to know how much regular, regularization you want to put that. And people in causal inference have been also looking at different environment and get you know kind of stability and drive into a more like a causality and differential privacy, US sensor is gonna use it. It's a form of stability and the big thing about deep learning, people have been playing around with adversarial attacks and people have shown that it's very easy to attack deep learning driven uh, radiology um, diagnosis tools. You can completely flip by just alter, altering the images a little bit and get um, pretty um, very different diagnosis. So it's very fragile and we need to add stability to that. And in terms of data perturbation, it's also about data cleaning. I don't know how many of you are aware that there was this very famous paper appeared 2020, uh, 2010 by two Harvard economists. And the, the result was used a lot by um, the people who want austerity to argue that we shouldn't do simulation, uh, stimulus packages. So, and basically they showed that supposedly but the data units are different countries and different months, different, different years. And the conclusion they draw was high debt GP, GDP ratio is bad for growth. Therefore, you shouldn't have high debt. Therefore, you shouldn't have stimulus packages. Later, three other economies from Amherst tried to replicate the result and find that they made some errors. It's unclear. They lost some data set. There might be some coding error. And if you correct that, you get opposite result. So this was a huge impact paper and actually didn't really uh, withstand the stability test if you for reproducibility, both data and also coding errors. So the high impact result, I think definitely should be replicated by another group as a minimum. And for the stability paper I did 2013, I really tried to unite the data perturbation with model perturbation, just it's a perturbation and a lot of human choices and uh, judgment calls were there, right? And robust statistics basically worrying about data per uh, model perturbation. And I think for this group, you have different machine learning models, statistical models. Would you get the same result if you choose a different one? Okay, another well-known Perturbation, it's researcher to researcher perturbation. I have this four co-chairs of Cleaver here. And I don't know if you guys want to answer. If uh, if you work on the same problem, do you think you guys will get the same conclusion? Anybody want to answer that? I'll guess no. Yes. I've done this at different audiences and YouTube. So that's a concern to me. Unless you say that why is more trustworthy, Based on what? And then where is the objective science? So um, that's, we have nine models, right? We have nine predictions for the next 50 years. And the difference is from 1.5 degrees to 5.5 degrees of average global temperature increase. At least I'm glad that people actually show this. This is actually one form of called PCS uh, perturbation model, uh, perturbation intervals. And we need to, embrace and be transparent about this. So to summarize a bit, is that human judgment cause is ambiguous for every data science problem. 
you choose the problem you work on, you choose the data set, you choose how to clean, you, you decide on, so you can see that you can get very different results. So how do you, how do we move forward after recognizing all this judgment call? There's no magic, you document. So you have reality and you have models. Models are mental constructs. They have no reality unless you build a bridge. Do you think there's a bridge there or there's no bridge there? It's your job. Yes. Well, you don't see it, you're just imputing it. So that's why a lot of time people hope you believe you have a model in the same paper, you have some real data in the paper, therefore they are connected. And many papers don't really establish the link very well. By association, they think that they must be related. So it's your job or our job to give quantitative and qualitative narratives through documentation, either by our Markdown or Jupyter Notebook, so that help yourself to think through and then um, help others to, to know how to trust. If you choose random forest, you need to make a case. Why? Why not deep learning? Why not kernel machines? Oh, you said, I don't know that. Say that. Then I know why you did that. Otherwise, maybe you try all of them. If you don't know which one's better, and then you should report all the results or only trust the part they are consistent. Otherwise, you're not on solid ground. We have a crooked house. So people ask me, how do you choose perturbations, PCS? You cannot possibly try all parts of it. You know, this is exponential. For every step, you have three choices. You multiply, you will never finish. So that's why you need to document. And you make the choice through documentation or you random choose some folks, and then you report. If you pledge to stability principle, if you try too many things, then you won't end up anything consistent. So this is really, if you apply to stability principle, you either argue certain paths is better, or you should only report when all the paths give you the same result. And if you try too many, you mostly end up with nothing. Nothing will be consistent. So this encourages you to think hard when you make these choices and based on some solid evidence. And documentation is, is such an integral part of this PCS framework. So you make an argument why something's more appropriate than others. And if you don't want non-result, you think hard and bring in evidence so that you don't try all possible uh, perturbations. And we also wanted to expand statistical inference and the PC because statistical inference is assuming a probability model, sometimes validated, sometimes not. And I have had problem with teaching uh, statistical inference when we don't really talk a lot about how to back up a probability model. And I think we don't have the power to decide what's true, what's not, we provide a form of evidence. And so we need to provide evidence in a transparent manner. And there was quite a bit of um, critique criticism p-value, but as Yuval Benjamini said, it's not really p-value's fault, it's really the fault of the people using it. P-value is clearly under probabilistic assumption. If you don't back it up and then you get the wrong result, it's really not p-value, it's like you didn't know how to use p-value, right? And we also need to expand the statistical inference to um, more than a probabilistic framework. And I recently uh, find using a random variable is actually an assumption, which I have been, had before this, like five, 25 years of teaching, I didn't have a problem. Anything seemed to be, have something I know, use a random variable. But if you think carefully, there's randomness in some process, it doesn't mean it's a random variable because random variable make more assumption than, oh, there's randomness. The reason is that you have only one data set, you don't need a random variable. That's what you care about. When you bring in the random variable notation, you implicitly assume there's another data set which could be collected either by somebody else or in the future that it's a realization of the same random variable. If there's no such a situation, why do you bother with a random variable? So implicitly you're assuming stability that the two experiments similar enough 
they can be viewed as realization of the same random variable. So as soon as you write use probability theory, you're basically making assumptions already. And there's another problem is that the p-value is usually calculated assuming there's a correct model, which is never the case. And often it's really measuring a model bias. And that's a separate issue, a problematic with p-value. And as I alluded to earlier, when you have um, applied math people doing it, not always stochastic, we need to build a platform uh, so that two sources of modeling can be integrated. That's why the synthetic data perturbation idea is very useful here to merge the PDE data with the observational data. Okay, so here I don't have a lot of time left. I'll just say very briefly what we propose PCS inference. A lot of projects in my group right now is really implement this inference for a particular interdisciplinary research problem. Is that you should think about inference uh, from problem formulation. How do you map a particular qualitative uh, problem about something being important, say a particular gene being important for a particular cancer, into a mo model a specific question? Because to answer that question, this gene Y is important for, say, uh, breast cancer, the answer could be very different if you choose to use which data, which algorithm, you get different answers. So you might want to explore a range of such formulations than just a particular one you decide to do. Some people do, but they don't report. So you need to report it. And then before you do statistical, you know, like PCS inference, I think we need to do prediction screening. This is borrowing machine learning. I don't think you need to do a P test, a T test or something when you know your model doesn't have any reality. You have to at least have like a diagnosis to see that it seems to fit the data pretty well before you worry the next level of decision, which is p-value or something significant. Otherwise, you're just looking at the model bias. We did one particular quick um, simulation in the paper. We have a lot of other follow-up papers. This is for feature importance. I want to say a lot of times, feature importance is actually ranking features are very, very stable instead of having the p-values. You can use p-value to do that, but you don't have to use p-value. So this is a case. We simulated some sparse linear model and then uh, simulated many, many uh, five other experiments when the model was misspecified. And we compare our uh, PCS-driven uh, feature ranking with something post-selecting inference. And the other one, so-called the wrong inference, you just select them, use lasso, and then you forget you selected and you just use some totality normality to do ranking, so p-value. And our method, PCS, worked out pretty well. But to my surprise, actually, so-called the wrong method works pretty well for, for importance measures, for importance ranking. So this is not like uh, looking at getting the p-value right, but it's using this selection and ranking that uh, actually the post-selecting information didn't fail so well. But of course, they tried to solve a different problem. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's not like every time you need to correct for post-selection inference, depends on what you want to do. And the post selection inference might not be very robust if the model is wrong, because a lot of assumptions baked into the cor correction. For post selection inference, I still just like if you have kind of ex symmetric exchangeable data situ, just do sample split. That's still something I preferred than the more refined ways, which rely a lot on model assumption. OK. So I already said you guys already practicing PCS inference because you have nine models and getting an interval. I just to very brief that we have been adding stability to a lot of criteria um, methods. Like this is one to discover gene gene interaction beyond second order and polynomial interaction doesn't work for genomics. So we need to pull in type of uh, interaction which have genomics uh, biology backing. And then we add stability to random forests. And then we got really good result. In this particular case, we actually find interactions, 80% of them already validated, use old technology of uh, bad experiments, bad lab experiment in the genomics. Okay, to summarize. So I think vertical size is part, uh, part of trustworthy AI. You need documentation and we need workflow. And we try to expand statistical inference to in take into account model perturbations, data cleaning perturbations, and possibly research researcher perturbations. 
And we have many case studies. We uh, have been working on deep learning for interpret machine learning as well. And what I want to emphasize, domain now is very important, right? I'm wanting to use deep learning for genomic problem because I feel like the Boolean function type of decision trees are very useful, matching biology. And of course, I want to thank my group that people really make the radical happen. And we also do relevant theory work, actually quite coming back to theory quite a bit with a random forest and also deep learning because they're quite useful for particular problems we've been working on. And the papers are at my website. And I want to advertise a bit another piece of work which I haven't had time to talk about. It's a PDR framework for uh, interpret machine learning. P means predictability. And D means descriptive accuracy. And R means relevance. And you need to talk about a particular audience. And this random forest software is an improved version called Sign Random Forest, E3 Random Forest, all on the, our website. And I want to also have a shout out for our book. I'm working with my former student, Rebecca Barter, to have this PCS framework into uh, the textbook. We'll have an online free version. And she really tried to rethink about how we do statistics education, more introduced with some data cleaning, team building, and computing platform choice, and then prediction, and a very careful introduction of random variables and uh, probability framework, and then some inference and integrated with machine learning. So it's really aimed at both upper division students, beginning PhD students, and also people who from outside want to get into deep learning and try to lower the entry point uh, to get into data science. And also a shout out for Berkey data science. We now have been doing this for six years and we have super successful two courses, Data 8X on YouTube. You can take the class for someone maybe beginning data science in your field. It's like $500 uh, tuition. And uh, you learn Python, you learn um, statistics together. And we have Data 100. We also now have Data 102. So thousands of students. And we have new associate provosts for data science with a new division called Division of Computing, Data Science, and Society, CDSS with Jennifer Chase uh, from Microsoft. I think. Here are just some questions. My hope that you guys find what I, the framework we build useful for this group. Is that PCS clever protocol, conceptual level and, and modify for your particular problem useful for this group? Documentation template, maybe build a computing platform. A lot of uh, stability perturbation can be done with the same wrap that everybody had to build out their own stability kind of uh, codes, and maybe the PDR, predictive accuracy, distributed accuracy, and relevancy paper, which I didn't have time to talk about, could be a beginning framework for interpretability in this uh, community. I hope the book will be useful too. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and Tom will help me moderate them. Um, he'll, have, he'll call you out loud so you can ask your question to Ben. OK, so I, I do not see yet any questions in the chat bar. So maybe I will start with a question and encourage everyone to type questions in the chat bar during the, the last remaining 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so, so Professor Yu, I was wondering, um, thank you for, for a great talk. Um, in your paper, I know, I know you spent a lot of time sp um, detailing how to formalize PCS, and I was curious if, if you could tell us more how you formalize PCS in practice. For example, uh, let's say, you know, I've developed five different models and I have a, an accuracy metric. What would PCS tell me that the other, I think you had the uh, REC curves, that the other, that the other blue and green method, for example, you had a yeah. curve, would, would not tell me what kind of model would I, would I eliminate that other more traditional methods would not eliminate? Well, you have. To, can you give me a little background on the question? Like, um, so, I, so I can right now, point. yeah. Sorry. The right now, the PCS framework is really a suggestive framework. I try not to make hard calls for you. Small principles for you to think things through and document it. 
So for a particular project, I can tell you how we made the calls. Okay. So if you give me a, a so so for example, let me go back to iterative random forest, right? So everybody knows here a random forest. So we added a lot of perturbations and we, we develop a stability score. And for the uh, like uh, say um, two-way interactions, Boolean interactions, and we developed that score and we just decided a cut for the first paper at 0.5. And then later we realized when the model, when the data become noisier, we have to lower the we have to lower the cut. So, so the PCS, you can, if you do PCS inference, you have a reference distribution, you can still do the point like uh, 5% if you like the p-value, but it's really, um, say for under the PCS framework, you might be able to consider multiple uh, test statistics for the same hypothesis, for example. Hey, yeah, thank you. That's, that's very helpful to think about. Yeah. Um, and if you, and then for uh, deep learning and uh, neuroscience, we call deep tune. Is the paper is on the uh, on web on the internet. There we struggled for a year or two to decide how to use the uh, stability principle. In the end, we had eighteen different deep learning models in terms of prediction. Almost give very very similar predictions. You cannot tell them apart. Like the correlation between the predictions is like 0 0.92, right? And we struggled a long time to know how to do. In the end, we integrate the 18 models at the gradient descent. Like we try to use something like Deep Dream to interpret the models and we have 20 of them. So we, we brought in stability principle at the gradient level. So when you try to maximize this model, we have 18 of them. We take the lowest uh, gradient and we maximize that. But that took us a long time. For why we're just showing like 18 different images and say, see, they look similar before we were able to integrate together. So it's quite a problem specific, exactly what's the metric you use to bring stability. Th thank you. No, I think that's very relevant to climate uh, models too, where we also have a lot of models that give the same answer and don't always know which statistical model to choose. Uh, I, have a, yeah. I, have a, I have another question from, from Bully. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, first, uh, thanks. Um, thanks, uh, uh, Ben, for a great talk. Um, Hi, so I think this is very re related to our working group uh, in terms of climate uncertainty quantification. So based on your talk, should I understand uh, um, if we apply this uh, P, uh, PCS uh, to our climate, uh, climate uncertainty quantification, does that mean that we should explore more thoroughly about uh, the uncertainty of statistical models, like uh, we, we should try uh, different statistical models or give uh, perturbations to the data, and then finally we uh, have a more comprehensive understanding of the uncertainty with that, or did I misunderstand, miss something? No, I think there's a trade-off, right? I feel like you should first, I think we have this screening, right? Use basic predictability. So you should really compare the models based on kosher way of comparing some reality check. It doesn't have to be prediction, but some reality check, which the community agree on. So use that as a screening to uh, cut, screen some models out. It just doesn't mm -hmm. fit the data. But where to cut, you guys have to decide, right? You have to debate and decide where to cut. Uh -huh. After that, then depends on, suppose there's a particular parameter interest, which is, um, makes sense for all the models, and then you can start talking about how to integrate. Otherwise, I don't know the particular models. The, for ranking, right, you can rank different genes using random forest or using lasso, that's okay. That's why I want to compare different class of models through ranking. Mm -hmm. I don't want to quite compare p-values yet from random forest and lasso somehow doesn't feel quite right. So, so you have to compare, think about comparability. Mm -hmm. And then, if all these models pass the prediction test, you might say, hey, you know, there's this signs, some models should be deleted. Some So mm -hmm. after you done all of that, the remaining one, you should just re report the part that all the models are consistent. Okay, so first we kind of gave a rank of the model, which one is more close to reality and then based yeah. on, okay, got you, thank you.
or you just based on I think a lot of time you, you guys have to have human coming and have some debate and have some metric mm -hmm. agnostic to a particular model and you just use those criteria to agree make decisions that's what a lot of the magical decisions are being made right you have the experts in my room how do we treat this particular kid with a rare disease right mm -hmm. they bring in genomic data mm -hmm. and they have a debate and then they desire a treatment so similarly but you want to document the the uh, the procedure ahead of time very clearly. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. We ne also need to work closely with the climate scientists to, to make some yeah. decisions. Yeah. And I have agreement on what's uh, admissible uh, evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So I think predictability, prediction accuracy is the minimum, but you want to bring in other reality check. Or you might say the science already shown certain model just not good, and you did it that, but you document that. Oh, okay. Do do okay, so I see. Just make it, it more. It's very important part of this framework. Oh, make it. I mean, this is no magic. There's no magic. I mean, it's a hard problem, and I don't want to make it sound like there's magic. But I hope this framework will encourage people to be more transparent and think harder. Agree. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Transparent is very important. I think yes. And I think even. Even for a researcher, him or herself, even without somebody looking over their shoulder, if you force them to write it out, usually people become more rigorous too, just because they're documenting it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah. we're busy. It's easy to say, "Oh, that's okay. That doesn't, you know." But it's really habit forming. <laughs> yeah, agree. For doing data science. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank and you. And we're slowing down, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. I see some other people having questions, so I don't want to okay. <laughs> occupy yourself, uh, occupy you by myself. Yeah. So we have, well, we have, oh, sorry. I, I saw a question coming about XAI. Yes, Ime, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Sure, I was just wondering how does, I mean, we talked about domain knowledge coming in. How do, what do you see as the role of explainable AI in, in all this? Because if you understand better what your machine learning method is doing, uh, it's likely it's also more stable by definition. But, but what do you think about the whole interplay of that? Well, I see stability as a minimum requirement for interpretation. It's not whole interpretation, but I don't think you should try to interpret anything if things are just moving like crazy, right? But you have to decide on a, a qualitative or a threshold what's stable. And experimental AI, so the framework we established in the interpret machine learning paper is like, again, you use prediction as a way first cut before you want to interpret. But the prediction accuracy is not absolute. Sometimes your problem is very noisy. So it's problem dependent. And then you go to descriptive, descriptive accuracy that you have to go into the domain and talk to the domain expert. We want to emphasize the relevance to a particular human audience. Interpretation doesn't make sense if you don't have a particular audience in mind. So that should be defined. And then um, you want to really describe what's the purpose of this interpretation too. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you have like your minimal levels, like stability is a necessary condition. And then you have yeah. the higher levels that if you can get to those two, that's great. But otherwise, you stick with the minimal ones. Yeah. Okay. And then you want to keep the audience in mind. Absolutely. Who, who this interpretation will be. I mean, somebody as a patient, somebody interviewing you, or somebody just like from another field will be very different. I totally agree. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's why PDR, predictability and descriptability, and also um, relevancy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So um, I invite everyone who has more questions to uh, contact uh, Professor Yu, who, uh, who's, I think yes, email, whose email can be found uh, on the web. Uh, and uh, she also gave link to, she has a, a recent preprint about vertical data science. And I think now we're gonna transition to a closed group meeting discussion. So I think Jenny will take over now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so thank you everyone for joining us. I'll send a recording out um, through the e-list and also on our website. Um, and our next data science webinar will be in two weeks and it'll feature Pulong Ma. So thank you everyone for joining.